Praise the Lord. Isn't it wonderful to be in the presence of God for our Sunday worship? I will bless his name for making you faithful that you are there. I will pray that the blessings of the Lord will multiply in every life as we are together today once again in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this moment. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your fatherly care. Thank you because you are concerned for everything concerning our lives. We're asking, Lord, that you bless every one of us today, our children, our youths, our teenagers, and our young adults, and all the brethren who are gathered together, fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, bless everyone in Jesus' name. Let your love prevail in every heart. And Lord, we pray you refresh us, even in your word today, in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Once again, I welcome you. So happy to have you. It's always a joy to minister to you. Today, we're talking about something very important, something fundamental, something foundational in the Word of God. In fact, you will see that as far back as at the beginning, the Lord made them male and female in chapter 1 of Genesis. And then in chapter 2, we're told he had a reason for that. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, please open your Bible. Thank you. God bless you. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. The Lord who created man and the Lord who knew his plan and his purpose for creating man. He said, it is not good for the man, Adam, the only man at that time and the created man at that time. The very origin of the whole population of the world, it says it's not good for the man that he should be alone. I will make him and help me. I will make him a companion. I will make him a spouse. I will make him a companion that is suitable for him. And then he tells us in verse 21, he says, And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. It tells us the purpose of that in verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her and brought her and brought her unto the man. And look at this. It says it was God that planned that false marriage. It was God that instituted the marriage. And it was God that brought the man and the woman, the woman to the man. And it was God that brought them together. But you know what God has done? He took a, a part of the reed. He didn't take the bone from the feet to tell us that God did not want the man, the husband, to trample on the woman and to trample on the wife. He did not make, he did not take the bone from the head so that it will not be like, uh, you know, the man is using his mental faculty to overrule the, the woman. He took the reef from the side, that is, from near the heart. At the very beginning, that symbolizes the love, the heart that we ought to have, that a man and the wife, the husband and the wife ought to have. And in fact, it says in verse 23, it says, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones. It's saying that he recognized the Lord gave him discernment, recognition, and said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Taken out of the man, the Lord then brought her back to the man. And look at now the principle that follows and the thing that follows as a result of that initial union, initial marriage, and initial coming together. It says, therefore, that what therefore means because of what he did in the first union and because of what God had performed and what he had done, 
for Adam, bringing Eve unto him, it says, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I want you to notice that tw verse 24 very well. Adam did not have a father. Adam did not have a mother. But he said, for all the generation that will follow, for all the men, all the women that will follow, therefore, because of what has been done now, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I want to remind you that the, at that time there were no tribes at that time, there were no nations. At that time, there were no generations of people. At that time, there was no denomination. At that time, there was no religion. I saw that is this religion, that religion, and that religion, so that people will say, well, we practice this because of our denomination. We practice this because of our religion. Before any of those things came to the world, it says at the very foundation of marriage, at the very foundation of uniting a man and the wife together, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. You'll find that that's exactly what Christ emphasized when he was asked about marriage. We're coming to Matthew chapter 19. We're reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 19. We're reading from verse 4. And he, this is Christ, now answered and said unto them, Have you not read? He said, if you're looking for solution to the marriage problem, have you not read? If you have any question concerning marriage, concerning the family, have you not read? If you're looking for the fulfillment of the purpose of God in marriage, your own marriage, the marriage of your children, and the marriage of members of the church, the marriage of anyone, if there is any question at all about marriage, the Lord is pointing us back to the Bible, back to the beginning and back to the foundation. And it says, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning, Christ confirmed creation, not evolution. Christ confirmed that it was God that made the man, the woman, at the beginning. We didn't come from apes. We came right from the hand of the Creator. That he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female. Look at verse 5. It says in verse 5, it says, uh, And said, For this cause, for this reason, for this purpose, shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and day twain, day two, man, woman, day two, husband, wife, day two, shall be one flesh. And then it says in verse 6, wherefore, there are no more twain, but one flesh, what therefore? God has joined together. Let not man put asunder. We're looking at the message today on God's gift of a good, godly family. God's gift of a good, godly family. There are three points we're looking at as we consider this. Number one, is preeminent purpose for a good, helpful family. What's the purpose of God? Why did God institute marriage is preeminent purpose for a good, helpful family? Point number two, personal preparation for a godly, happy family. Personal preparation for a godly, happy family. Point number three, progressive partnership in a growing, healthy family. Progressive partnership in a growing, healthy family. We're coming to point number one, and that is the preeminent purpose of God for a good, helpful family. If we're going to do anything, and we're going to do it well, my brother, my sister, my boy, my girl, son, daughter there, 
we need a good purpose. And if our purpose aligns with the purpose of God, that makes us to have the very best. God is thinking about us, and we're thinking about God, and we're thinking like God. God has a plan, and our plan is like the plan of God himself. God has a purpose. Our purpose is like the purpose of God himself. And when we make that purpose of God preeminent in our union, preeminent in our marriage, preeminent in our family, then we'll have the help and the strength and the progress that the Lord intended when he instituted marriage. What are the purposes we can identify, outline from the word of God? There are seven of them we have listed together, and I'm just going to go through, and then we'll pick them up briefly one by one. Number one, purposeful partnership. Number two, perpetual purity. Number three is prevailing power. And number four, pertinent protection. Number five, precious procreation. Number six, parental provision. Number seven, participatory pilgrimage. That's the purpose of God. That's what he had in mind. Now, if you're planning to get married, you must have that purpose in heart. It's not just, I feel I'm old enough now. I want to get married. Mommy, uh, daddy, I'm thinking about marriage. Yes, it's good to think about marriage, but you must have the purpose in mind. Look at number one, purposeful partnership. We're looking at Genesis chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 18. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. The man, in, the, in this case now, the man Adam. If you're a man, if you're a brother, put your name there. It is no good that this man mentioning your name should be alone. If you're married already, you must still understand it is no good that you will be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That's why we titled this a good, helpful family. Your wife is to be a help to you. And your husband is to be a help to you. And God said, this is my purpose. We must always have that in mind. I give you this. I give you the wife. I give you the husband so that there will be a purposeful partnership. We're looking at number two there, perpetual purity. The Lord wants the whole church and the whole community and the whole world actually to be pure, to be all right, and to be righteous. And because of that, he said, immorality will defile, the generation will corrupt the whole world. And so he gives us the purpose of marriage. Number two, perpetual perpetual purity. First Corinthians chapter 7, we're looking at verse 2. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, you know, he wants us to be pure. He, he doesn't want us to be messing up our lives. And he says, he has given us a solution for that. And nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Every man, every man, every man his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. What's the purpose to avoid fornication? to avoid immorality, to avoid adultery. Look at verse 9. You see, there are people that will say, no, I'm not going to get married. Maybe they have some reasons why they're saying they don't want to get married. They might be thinking of their age. They might be thinking of uh, their situation in life. And they say, this is where I'm going to stand. God doesn't force marriage on anyone. He says, I'm giving you the wife to help you. I'm giving you the husband to help you. And if you say, I don't want to, but it says in verse 9, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. It is better to marry than to burn. If you have uh, maybe carelessly or you have flippant, uh, in a flippant way, you have said, I will not marry. I will stay like this. I will keep on serving God. 
but we discover that that decision was not of God because your body is burning and your body cannot contain it. You go back to God and say, Lord, I am sorry that I said this, that I will not marry. You know, my brother, when we talk of repentance, we repent of sinful acts, we repent of sinful decision, we repent of sinful utterance. If we've said something and we see that that thing now is not helping us and it's not going to allow us to get to heaven because our body is burning and the body is pushing us to go outside and to do something, we'll repent of the foolish utterance we mentioned before God. We say, Lord, I say I cannot contain and I read in the word of God, it is better to marry than to burn. It says, if they cannot contain, let them marry. It is better to marry than to burn. Number three now is the prevailing power. Prevailing power. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, we're reading from verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, reading from verse 9, it says two are better than one. Always two are better than one. Whatever reason somebody might have, I have the strength, I have the power, I have the skill, I have the money, I have the wherewithal, I have intelligence. Adam had intelligence and Adam had riches. Adam had the whole creation of God in his possession. And that man, Adam, he had knowledge and yet God said it is not good that that man, intelligent man, rich man, pure man, righteous man, it is not good that he should be alone. My brother, my sister, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it tells us if one prevail against him, two shall uh, withstand him, and the threefold cord is not quickly broken. If there's any challenge in life that will overwhelm a man, overwhelm a woman, that's why it says if one prevail against him, if an enemy prevail against him, if a situation prevail against him, two shall withstand him. As you look at, uh, you know, marriage, you see that this is the help the Lord has offered us so that the two will be able to think together, they'll be able to plan together, they'll be able to go together. My young brother, my young sister, you are thinking about marriage. This is the reason why it's partnership that is purposeful in the sight of God. It's purity that is perpetual. It helps us. The Lord knows that salvation is there. He knows sanctification is there. He knows grace is there. He didn't say uh, to avoid fornication. Let everyone have grace. That's available. Let everyone have uh, the Bible. That's available. But the wife protects the husband from uh, a life that is impure. Perpetual purity and prevailing power. It tells us in Matthew chapter 18, uh, Matthew chapter 18, and we're reading from verse 19. In Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 19, it says, And I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. It helps us and gives us power and prevailing power in prayer that the husband and the wife can join together, agree together, and they will not say anything negative as to what they have demanded as before the Lord. It grants us prevailing power. Number for pertinent protection, pertinent protection. You see, a marriage protects us. Marriage, that's, that's the plan of God, that marriage will give us protection. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're looking at verse 7. It says, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Dwell with your wife according to knowledge. And my sister, dwell with your husband according to knowledge. And those who are still getting married, they are planning marriage, let us understand and have this knowledge, giving honor unto the wife 
as unto a weaker vessel. Think about that. Giving honor unto the wife as unto a weaker vessel. What's a vessel? You understand? You know vessel. Either the vessel is made of clay or made of ceramic uh, material. When that vessel, if you, if you want to break that vessel, you can easily knock that vessel. But if you put the vessel under protection, like in a box, like under a cover, because it's a weak vessel, it will not be easily broken. And it says, we give honor to the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. It's for protection, pertinent protection, present protection, perpetual protection. Number five, precious procreation. Precious procreation. You see, the Lord wanted the uh, society to keep on growing and growing. And he tells us in Genesis, we're looking at uh, chapter 1, verse 27. Genesis chapter 1, we're reading from verse 27. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Why? Look at verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That is, fill up the earth, cover the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. I want you to understand this. God blessed them, and God said unto them, I created you both now, male and female, husband and wife. And I put you together in the family setting so that you'll be fruitful, so that you'll multiply, so that you will replenish the earth and subdue it. Let's stop there for a moment. That's procreation. God had created. And procreation means the process of creation. Pro, process, creation, procreation. The process of creation will continue because of the man and the wife. Let, let's look at this as you think about procreation. You know now we have many religions now in the world and generally when husband and wife, when they bring forth children, that's procreation, they will teach that child, they will indoctrinate that child and they will show that child that this is the way father and mother, this is the way we are following. And that way they want the child to follow by and large, except a great miraculous conversion takes place, those children will keep on following the way of the father and the mother. I want you to understand, if you have that religion, and you have another religion, and then we have Christianity, if in all the other religion, they encourage marriage, which is legitimate, and they encourage man and woman, their child, their son, daughters, coming together in marriage, and they marry, and they're having children. They're filling up the earth, they're replenishing the earth, but they're replenishing the earth with their own kind. And they're replenishing the earth with people, with children of their own religion. Now we come to the church, and the church is very slow, and the church is sluggish, and the church is stingy, and the church has a lot of rules and a lot of regulations whereby they slow down being fruitful and multiplying and replenishing the earth. And what that means then is that all the other religions, even the Christian religion, but Christian religion that may not be talking about salvation, about being born again, they are fast, they are growing, and they move on, and they multiply, and they are fruitful, and they replenish the earth. But the gospel people, the children of God, those who believe salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, without holiness, no man shall save the Lord. The only problem with them is they do not get married in time. And they are not fruitful. 
and they are not multiplying and they are not replenishing the church, they are not replenishing the family of God, they are not replenishing the flock. All the other religions as they grow, eventually they swallow up those churches that are not uh, mar getting married and they are not uh, reproducing themselves and they are not training their children in the way they should go. This is telling us God has given us the green light and the opportunity, even the commandment, and he said there must be precious procreation. Let's take the bottlenecks and the holders out of the way. Our marriage committees are there to encourage us and to encourage our young people. It's not to put hindrances before them. They're 30, they cannot get married yet. 35, they cannot get married yet. 40, they cannot get married yet. I was saying it remains this, it remains this, it remains that. Let's take unnecessary um, hurdles out of the way of the young people and let us understand the mind of God, the purpose of God in procreation. Number six is parental provision. Parental provision. When those children are brought into the world, they are helpless and they cannot provide for themselves. And it is uh, the parent that will give them uh, the food and the clothing and the shelter and the training and the fellowship and the upbringing. That's why God has given us the marriage. It tells us in uh, Proverbs chapter 22, and we're looking at verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22, we're reading from verse 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. It's good to send them to school, but a lot of training should have gone on from the moment the child is born. A lot of training from the father, from the mother, from the parents. And that's why God has given us the children. And as you are planning marriage, my son, as you are planning marriage, my daughter, you must understand when the child child comes, am I going to train the child? In what way will I lead the child? And you are getting married to somebody that can also have the same idea, the same understanding, the same doctrine, the same way of life that will teach the child like you would teach the child in the way the child should go. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from age. Number seven is participatory pilgrimage. That means we're pilgrims. And in walking alone sometimes can be frustrating. But when we have a partner, when we have a wife, when you have a husband, when you have somebody walking along with you, when you are tired, the other person will encourage you participatory pilgrimage. As we look at Hebrews, reading from chapter 11. Hebrews Chapter 11, reading from verse 7, it talks about Noah and it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Have you noticed that? To the saving of his house. As they are together, they can encourage each other. As they are together, they can remind each other of the promise of God. A flood is coming, and the Lord has told you, my husband, to make this act. We are in agreement with you, and all the children, they are moving along together, participatory pilgrimage, and it says, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is of faith. It tells us in verse 8, look at verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed, he obeyed, he went out not knowing whither he went. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, I through faith also Sarah herself. Through faith also Sarah herself. Abraham had faith and Sarah had faith and they could walk together. And when Abraham said something that wasn't to be, Sarah said, but this is what will be. And God confirmed. You see, both of them walking together. They led, helping the right, 
the right hand, helping the left hand so that they can walk together as they moved on. Look at verse 23. In verse 23, it says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. By faith, his parents, his parents, they hid him, they preserved him. That's it. They were, it's not just one idea, one person having the idea, participatory pilgrimage. And look at verse 27. In verse 27, we're told by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seen him who is invisible. The same faith in the mother was in Moses. The same faith in the father was in Moses. They were walking together, going on by faith together, knowing that this is the purpose of my being on earth. The mother had uh, told uh, the son that, and he got that to heart. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand and we need to uh, keep in our mind the purpose of marriage as we are planning marriage. Point number two, we're looking at personal preparation for a godly, happy family. Brother, sister, we need to make preparation for a godly, happy family. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 24, reading from verse 27. Proverbs chapter 24, we're looking at verse 27. Prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field, and afterwards build thine house. We take a principle from there, we learn a lesson from there. We're going to build the home. We're going to build the family. We're going to build the house. And this is my house, my home. What kind of home do you want to have? What kind of family you, do you want to have? Prepare thy work first without, before you get into that marriage, before you start the building, before you consummate that marriage, prepare. Prepare thy work without. Make it fit for thyself. Already you have the understanding of the purpose and you have the understanding of the pattern of what the home should be. Make it fit for thyself. That's why we're making preparation and that's why we're calling upon the Lord to help us to have a proper family. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, proper relationship with the Lord proper relationship with the Lord. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're looking at it from verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Uh, that's uh, the Lord is saying uh, he counts you a believer. That's why he can give you a commandment. He cannot just uh, come out of the blue and give you a commandment when you don't have relationship with him. He says, you are a believer. You are my child. You're already now in the light and you are righteous. Then be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? is pinpointing the fact that you are righteous if you are born again and is talking to you. Do not be unequally yoked together with those who are unrighteous. What communion has light with darkness? It says you have a relationship with God. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. And you are light in the Lord. You have no relationship with darkness. And in verse 15, it says, and what concord? What fellowship, what covenant has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? It's saying that you have a relationship with the Lord as you are thinking about marriage. Know who you are and know your position and you know your personality and know your spirituality that you believe in the Lord, are you going to get to an infidel? He commands, we must not do that. And then in verse 16, it says, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols is counting you a child of God, it's the temple of God. For ye are the temple of the living God, ye 
at the temple of the living God, you have a relationship with the Lord. And it says, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. If you have not had a relationship with the Lord, if you have not come into Christ, if you are not sure of salvation, the Lord wants you to do that. That's part of the preparation for marriage. In verse 17, it says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, verse 18, and it says, And ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He wants us to understand that he will be a father because Christ becomes a redeemer, because Christ is our savior, because our sins are washed away. He says, come out from among them. He's talking about repentance. Repent. If you have not repented, have regeneration. If you have not been born again, let it be now, and then you'll be a new creature in Christ. He says, then I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons, and ye shall be my daughters, says the Lord Almighty, proper appropriate spiritual relationship in the Lord. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. How do you know you have a relationship with the Lord? You are a new creature. The person you, you said, you prayed about, and uh, she is the will of God, or he is the will of God. How do you know he has a relationship with the Lord, or she has a relationship with the Lord? If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what he wants. He wants us to understand that that relationship with the Lord is firm. It's very clear. He tells us in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, we're looking at verse 6. Here the Lord is talking about his own disciples and he's talking about anyone who has got relationship with the Lord. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world, out of the world, out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. That's the relationship. The relationship that you ought to have with the Lord, that God will say, I know him, I know her, he's my child, she is my child. And when you are praying for the will of God in marriage, it says, I'll give you the very best. I have a plan for your life. And it says in verse 14 of that John chapter 17, it says in verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. I've given them thy word, and the world has hated them. Actually, if you have a relationship with the Lord, you have accepted the word of God. And Jesus said, and the world has hated them. The world that hates you will not give you a good thing. If you were really a child of God, the world that hates you will not give you a good wife will not give you a good husband. If they give you anyone at all, they want to give you somebody that will derail you, discourage you, that will distract your attention, that will make you not to get to heaven. If you're a real child of God, the relationship you have with the Lord is affirmed from heaven and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, it says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. I pray not that you take them out of the school they are going in the world, out of the market they are selling in the world, out of the offices where they are working in the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Satan is evil, is in the world. 
all the sinners in the world, they're evil. And the Lord said that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. He emphasizes again in verse 16. He says, they are not of the world. They have relationship with God, proper relationship with the Lord. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Let's look at number two now. After you have affirmed and God has confirmed your relationship with him, now you want to pray. You want to pray for the will of God. Number two, prayerful request from the Lord. Prayerful request from the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 14. Proverbs chapter 19, reading from verse 14, it says, House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife, a wise wife, an uplifting wife, a good wife, a supportive wife, a happy wife, and a wife that is going to make you progress in the line, in the direction God has earmarked for you. Such a wife, a prudent wife, is from the Lord. Now, if something is from the Lord, how do I get that thing from the Lord? Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is from the Lord. How did I have the salvation? And grace is from the Lord. How do I have the grace from the Lord? And sanctification, holiness, a new heart is from the Lord. How do I have that new heart from the Lord? By prayer, by making a request, and by talking to the Lord. I need grace, he gives us grace. I need salvation, he gives us salvation. I need healing. Anything from the Lord we get, we receive, we obtain, we keep by prayer. A prudent wife is from the Lord. And that wife from the Lord we get through prayer. In Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29 and we're reading from verse 11. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. You must understand, God is thinking about you. That's why it's wrong for you to leave God behind and run ahead. I will say, what, where are you running to? I'm running to look for a wife. I'm running to look for a husband. Where is God? You let God behind, come back, I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. All those expectations you have in your heart, a wife like this, a husband like this, the Lord said, I want to give you, come to me, come to God. I will give you the expected end. In verse 12, it says, in verse 12, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. The Lord has given us assurance. There are some people who are doubting. They are doubting themselves. They are doubting God. And they're saying, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to ask. And if I ask, I don't know whether God will answer me. If you are born again, God is your father. If you were to ask your earthly father to give you something good, and your earthly father has promised that thing, and has said that he will give you, especially now he knows you of age, and he wants to give you that thing, you know how to ask your earthly father. In the same way, you will ask the heavenly father. And then it says in verse 13, in verse 13, and you shall seek me, and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. It tells us in Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 7. Matthew chapter 7, we're reading from verse 7. It says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. You need a wife, ask, it shall be given unto you. And you need a husband, ask, it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And then in verse 8, it says, For everyone that asketh receiveth. You ask the Lord, everyone that asketh receiveth. 
You are praying to the Lord. Everyone that asketh, receiveth. He will answer your prayer. And he will give you his own expectation. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And now he gives us an illustration from verse 9. Or what man is there of you? Whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? And then in verse 10, or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Look at the conclusion in verse 11. If he then been evil of the offspring of Adam, with the Adamic nature, if you know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, who is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him good things, good things? I was told in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22, he who finds the wife finds a good thing. Look at your Bible, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And the Lord said, how much more shall God, your Father, Heavenly Father, give you good things because you ask him. Just make sure there's no idol in the heart. Make sure that you love the Lord. Make sure that you really depend on the Lord and you know he'll give you the best. He will answer your prayer in Jesus' name. I want your amen to come out with a smile. I said he will answer your prayer in Jesus' name. Now, number three, protective righteousness before the Lord. Protective righteousness before the Lord. You see, when we remain righteous before the Lord, we don't say, I'm looking for this now, and I cannot follow doctrine, I cannot follow Bible, I cannot follow righteousness. We hurt ourselves. Because you understand that righteousness is our protection before the Lord. He'll protect you from evil people. He'll protect you from an evil choice. He'll protect you from Satan. He'll protect you from an evil world. Isaiah chapter 54, we're reading from verse 17. Isaiah chapter 54, and we're reading from verse 17. It says in verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. We need this promise of God and we need this protection of God as we are planning for marriage, as we want the best in marriage. No weapon that is formed or fashioned against you shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, says the Lord. The righteousness is of me, says the Lord. The righteousness that comes by grace, that comes by faith, will be a protection in your life. Will protect you from all attack, protect you from all evil. That's why we want to make sure that at the time of the courtship, at the time when we have now said this is the will of God, and we are talking together, and we are relating together, and we are discussing and planning together, righteousness, all that period, must be the protection of our marriage that we are planning. And eventually when it comes to the day of wedding, and you are not doing the wedding to please the world. After all, after all the world hates you. And you are not doing the, uh, the wedding uh, to uh, interest the world and to do what the world wants to do. You need protection from the world even during that time of, uh, of wedding and in reception, everything, you want to do everything in righteousness because righteousness brings protection. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're reading from verse 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink 
or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. As you take steps according to the word of God, now you have prayed, has answered your prayer. If you have not got the answer yet, he will answer your prayer and the Lord will make it definite in your heart. That's the man, that's the woman, that's the child of God, that's the son of God, daughter of God. You are going to get married. From that time, you know the will of God and you talk to each other according to the word of God. And then you are now moving together. You are discussing together everything you do, whether you eat or you drink, or whatsoever you do, you do all to the glory of God. And the wedding, and the paying of dowry, and then going to the registry, making everything formal and everything proper, that you are not lawless in any area, whether ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, you do all to the glory of God. And the Lord will bless your union and your marriage in Jesus name. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 21. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. There might be people that will advise you, are you in courtship, do it this way, do it this way, prove all things, examine all things, is it according to the righteous pattern God has laid down in the world? We're not talking of tradition. We're not talking of denominational rules and orders. We're talking about the word of God, which is the word of righteousness. Prove all things and hold fast that which is good. And then in verse 22, it says, you abstain from all appearance of evil. The Lord will be with you, my son. The Lord will be with you, my daughter. And everything will be to the glory of God. You'll have a good marriage. You'll have a happy marriage. You'll have a godly family. And the Lord will grant you even beyond what you're expecting in the marriage in Jesus' name. Now, after we come together, after we have now gotten married, how do we conduct the marriage? Point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at progressive partnership in a growing, healthy family. Progressive partnership in a growing, healthy family. As you come together, and now you have married, after that marriage, think about the love you have. There must be increase in that love, progress in that love. Think about the joy you have as you have come together. We must understand that's just the foundation. That's just the beginning. There must be progress in that joy, in the work of your hand, in your profession. Look at the level where you are now. And God said two are better than one. The foundation has not been laid. Now you are married. The pro progress you have had, everything must increase now. Look at your thirst and your passion for heaven. Now you have got married. Now everything should increase. And look at your devotion to the work of the Lord. Now you are married. Now everything should now increase. Take this marriage as God gives for you to make progress in your life, in every area of your life. And your partnership should lead you to progress, growing, and you remain healthy. Look at three things. Number one, righteous fellowship in a gracious home. Righteous fellowship in a gracious home. On the line that word gracious, our home must be gracious. And everybody that sees a family, when they come to the family or hear about the family, everything is of grace. Number one, righteous fellowship in a gracious home. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1 that it says, Be ye followers of God as they as dear children. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And then in verse 2, it says in verse 2 that we walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. It says now the righteousness in the family, the righteousness in the fellowship, we're now walking in love. 
were walking in love. When you were alone, walking in love, you were looking at the word of God, and then you want to go to the office, you uh, open your door, you lock your door, you get your car, and then you go. But now, you're walking in love, you're married now. Before you go out, darling, I'm going out. I'll be such and such and such a place. You give that information. Why? Because you are now together. Because the two shall become one and you are now walking in, in love. When you have your salary, you have your money, you are now walking in love. When you are alone, you got the money and you thought about it. Am I going to spend this and where do I give this? And you took the decision by yourself. Of course, we're prayer. But now you are a child of God and you are a married man and you are a married woman. And you are walking in love now. The person you have in the house, uh, that is your your husband or your wife must not feel like a tenant, must not just feel like I'm alone and he is alone. To walk in love means that you make everything open to her, you make everything open to him, and you decide together this is the direction we're going, this is what we need at home, that is walking in love. It's practical and it is sacrificial, and it is selfless. You must not forget yourself and go back to how you were living, how you were conducting your life before you were married. Now that you are married, walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Underline that section, as Christ also has loved us. What's the love of Christ? You know, there was a time Christ was talking to his own disciples. He said, you are my friends. Because everything I heard from my father, I made known unto you. He said, you are not servants. I'm not treating you like slaves. I'm not treating you like servants. I'm treating you like friends. Because all that I heard of the father, I've given unto you. And that is the same thing, you know, as we're walking in love, as Christ has loved us, everything you have, you make it known to your husband. Everything you have, you make it known to your wife. There is uh, no hiding and there is no secrecy. And actually, if the Lord himself said that everything he had, he said, Father, he was praying to the Father. He said, Father, the glory you have given me, I have given to them. And that's the love he's talking about in a marriage. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us. The glory you have, the joy you have, and the honor you have, and the respect you have, the position you have in the family belongs to both of you. If you're going to love as Christ has loved, and he says, and has given himself for us, has given himself, he gave his totality unto the church, and the same thing we're to do. He has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. Look at verse 25. It says in verse 25, it says there, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You see, uh, when we get married, even before we get married, this is what we need to really pray about. You know, we're human beings of flesh and blood, and we're human beings, and we have a nature, and we have a upbringing. It's not something evil. We went to school. As we went to school, as we were teaching us English language, they didn't just teach us the grammar. They didn't just teach us how to put sentences together. They taught us the thought pattern of the English people as well. And then they brought literature. That's why you have English. You also have literature. And we read those literature books. In those literature books, everything in literature is about relationship. Either a good relationship, a bad relationship, a deceptive relationship that destroys lives. We read literature books and all those things are in our minds. If you've read Shakespeare, uh, that's one of the great uh, authors in uh, literature and other, other books too. 
all those relationships we have read, if we're not careful, everything comes back to our mind. Not only that, relationship in the community, in the village, and our father and our mother, everything comes back to us as we get married now. And the picture we have in mind, I can see daddy sitting there, I can see mommy standing, and I can see daddy always controlling, commanding, like they're in the, you know, in the barracks, do this and do this. That picture is in the mind, blot out that picture. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as, even as, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We must go back to that relationship in the Lord. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, it says, so ought men to love their wives as their own body. Underline that word ought. You know, many times, you know, in our language, we use that word ought every time. I ought to do this. I ought to go there. I ought to touch that. I ought to travel there. I ought every time. It's like I ought to, I ought to. And the wife is number seven, number eight of the I ought to. I ought to do this first before the wife. I ought to go there before the wife. I ought to brace up that before the wife. I ought to go and see my friend now before the wife. The number one ought, after you are saved, I ought to get saved. The number one ought, after you are sanctified, I ought to get sanctified. The number one ought, after you are ready for heaven and you are ready for the rapture, the number one ought in your life, so ought men to love their wives as their own body. That's the righteousness. That's the righteousness we have. The righteousness is not, I don't smoke. I don't smoke, but do you love your wife? I don't drink, do you love your wife? I don't steal, but do you love your wife? I don't, I don't. I don't. Let's forget about that negative area, that negative side of righteousness, the positive, practical, productive side of righteousness. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. You can tell. If you love your body or not, you take your bath every day, you wash your mouth every day, you dress well every day, you present a good, presentable body to the world every day. It says so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. I must, uh, you know, read that uh, verse now. I, I need to talk to our sisters. It says, so ought women to love their husbands as their own bodies. My sister, you know how you take care of your body, and thank God you must do that, and you keep on doing that, and you don't neglect that body, especially as you're getting older and older, and all that you need to do, all those uh, elements, all those nutrients, and all those uh, supplements, everything must always be in line so that you can still be as strong as you ought to be, and you can be as presentable, allow me to use the word, as beautiful as you ought to be. So ought women to love their husbands as their own bodies. She that loveth is her husband loveth herself. If you love your husband, you love yourself. It's talking about the practical righteousness we ought to have in the family. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, we're reading here now from verse 3. It's talking about what we do in the family. What we do, husband to wife, wife to husband, parents to children, children to parents, let nothing be done through strife of being glory. My brother, my sister, in our families, if you want to do something, is it being glory? Is it pride? Am I proud? My left hand should not be proud to my right hand. My left foot should not be proud to my other foot, my brain should not be proud to my heart. It says the man and the woman, they are now together. They are one. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. If the husband is uh, exercising, manifesting vainglory or strife to the wife, it's like the right hand exercising or manifesting pride to the left hand. It's like 
the tongue, manifesting pride to the ear. That should not be in the family. Here is the righteousness that keeps us in fellowship. Let nothing be done, nothing, nothing, nothing small, nothing flippant, nothing ordinary, nothing deep, nothing in the night, nothing when we're apart, nothing when you are seeking alone by yourself. Think the best of your wife and think the best of your husband. Plan the best for your wife and plan the best for your husband. It says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let each esteem other better than themselves. You are thinking about the husband, you are thinking about the wife, and the best for the husband, the best for the wife. Even when the husband says, I understand, you must be tired by now. I understand you're taking so much care of me, and you know, I'm in this condition. I hope I will soon come out of this condition. Go and rest, go and sleep. You can even travel out and, you know, make room for yourself. I understand. He is doing his part. And he's uh, giving you chance, but you will reply and say, I want the best for you also. When the right hand wants the best for the left hand, the left hand wants the best for the right hand. When each one, each partner wants the best for the other, that's the righteousness that he wants to have. And you esteem each other better than yourself. We're coming to number two now, is the refreshing fulfillment of growing helpfulness. The refreshing fulfillment of a growing helpfulness. Let's remember once again, at the very beginning, the origin of the marriage is to help. The origin of coming together is to help. And, you know, as now you are born again, you are a child of God, and you want the purpose of God, the plan of God to be fulfilled in the family, I want to remind you of what you know already. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, Thank, thank you. God bless you as you open your Bible. I know you know the verse, but let's look at it together again. And the Lord God said, and your creator said, and your redeemer said, and the one that brought you into the world, not to live the way you want to live, and not just to run ahead of God, run away from God, because God has created me now, leave me alone, God. You have created me, you have done your part. And the Lord God said, I've created you, but I've not finished creation. I need to create somebody for you. I need to give you somebody. And this is the person that will fulfill the purpose for which I made you. It is not good that the man should be alone. Of course, it is not good now that the woman should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. My brother, my sister, what do you think of marriage? You know, somebody said, I don't need children anymore. And since I don't need children, I don't see the need for marriage. Uh, you know what God is saying? Yes, he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. That's one reason. The other reason is, I will not want the man to be alone. Loneliness is a problem. Thinking alone, living alone, acting alone, doing everything alone. And there are times you need a companion. There are times you need a partner. There are times you need somebody by your side to go through and to lift the heavy weight of life with you. So don't say because after all, look at my age now, I'm beyond 45. Look at my age now, I'm near 50. And uh, even if I, you know, got married now, I, I'm not going to have any child. And that, that's, that's not the issue. It says, I will make him and help meet for him, suitable for him. We need help, we need help, a kind of help we could not get from neighbors, a kind of help we cannot get from even relatives, a kind of help you cannot even get from a child 
or from a parent, we need help, I will make him and help meet for him. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 11. 2 Samuel chapter 10, reading from verse 11. Look at this, and he said, If the Syrians be too strong for thee, then thou shalt help me. If the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. Do you see the word help, first part of the sentence? Help, the latter part of the sentence is reciprocal. Reciprocal. I help you, you help me. If I have a challenge, if she has a challenge, we have helped one to the other. Uh, that's the reason why you have a problem you're thinking of, you're sorrowful. My husband, what's the problem? Don't worry, I'll get over it. My husband looks like you're not as happy as you normally are. You're not as cheerful as you normally are. Uh, I understand, I'll, I'll sort myself out. Everything will be all right. Tell me now, you won't understand. You can't, this is not for women. This is just me. You understand? The reason why God has given you a wife and the reason why God has given you a husband is that you'll be of help one to the other. Uh, can I tell you one secret? There are times God will, will hold that idea from you and you think your wife will not understand. Naturally, she would not understand. But God, to fulfill his purpose of making her a help meet for you, he will give the right idea to the wife at that time. And the wife will not even know where the idea is coming from. Because God wants you to understand. I gave you to him and I gave you to her so that you can be of help one to another and you seem not to be looking at that area of the relationship that's why the Lord will so work something out as you open your mouth as you open your heart as you discuss with each other transparently the purpose of the marriage will be fulfilled if the serious be too strong for me then thou shalt help me but if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. Rapturable faithfulness for a glorious heaven. Rapturable faithfulness for a glorious heaven. You know, the reason why we're together is not just that we enjoy this world together. It's not just that we make good progress in this life together. It's so that by the grace of God, hand in hand, heart with heart, we're praying together, we're living together, we're reading together, we're fellowshipping together, and we love each other so that we help each other to make it on the day of rapture. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 19, First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, it says, And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have all men the most miserable. If marriage is only to help us have good business, build a good house, and then we have children, send them to school, and then we have good things in this life only. If that is only thing, the only thing marriage does will be of all men, of all women, most miserable. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But you know, if we go on and we're encouraging each other to endure on to the end, we're encouraging each other to be obedient to the word of God. And when we're tired, when we look warm, and when it appears there's no, there, there's no energy, no passion to move on, then the partner, then the spouse, the husband, the wife is lifting us up and helping us. And we're moving and we say, praise the Lord for my wife. Praise the Lord for my husband. I don't know what would have happened. I was so tired. I didn't even want to go to church. I didn't want 
husband to continue what he was doing, but this, my wife, has been a good help, a good encouragement. My husband has been a good help, a good encouragement, and now I am standing, and now I'm moving. I'm happy to remain a Christian. I'm happy. I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord. If the marriage does that for us, my brother, my sister, that is a major part in our marriage. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In verse 52, it says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the, tr at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. You'll be there in Jesus' name. Brother, sister, husband, wife, father, mother, parents, children will take part in that rapture, will encourage each other that will make it at the rapture in Jesus' name. Good marriage here. Godly marriage here, happy marriage here, healthy uh, marriage here, and then on that final day, you'll take part in the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19, and reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, we're looking at verse 7, let us be glad, husband and wife, let us be glad, children of God, let us be glad and rejoice, parents and children, let us be glad and rejoice, because we have not only heard about the rapture, we're ready for the rapture, we have not only heard about the coming of the Lord, we're prepared for the coming of the Lord, we have not only heard sermons and that lead us to pray, we've had a friend, we've had a companion, we've had our husband, we're having wife, and we're having children, we're having parents, and we're all encouraging one another that the rapture is about to take place, and the marriage has been a contributing factor to make us positively pursuing, making it at the rapture. Let us be glad then and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready, the church glorious has made herself ready, the church gracious has made herself ready, and in verse 8 it says, in verse 8, and to her was granted that she should be arranged in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And then in verse 9, in verse 9 it says, And he says unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those families, husband, wife, wife, husband, parents, children, happily you're moving on, happily you're preparing for the coming of the Lord, happily everything in the family is a great incentive for you to make it on that day of the rapture, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he says unto me, these are the true saints of God. Brother, sister, husband, wife, Father, mother, parents, children, we thank the Lord for what the Lord has revealed to us today. A good marriage on earth, a godly marriage on earth, a gracious home on earth. And then, as the trumpet shall sound, a good passage to glory. When the Lord shall come, my brother, you'll not be missing. Your marriage will not hinder your righteousness. Your marriage will not hinder the rapture. Your marriage will not hinder your relationship with the Lord. It will build you up. It will encourage you. It will move you forward. Let's forget the past now and let us start afresh today. Everything we ought to be in the Lord, the Lord will do in our lives. Grace upon grace in your life. Love upon love in your life. Good fellowship in your family, in your heart, and in the church of the living God. And by the grace of God, in the love of God, this love of God will grow in our hearts and grow in our homes and grow in our families. And you'll help each other to make it on the final day. Amen for your family.
Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We've heard a lot about getting ready, about preparing. A wife, a husband is God's gift. A wife, a husband is God's favor. A wife, a husband is God's gracious offer, provision for you, for me, for us all. Let's prepare. If you are not married yet, get prepared. And let all these things be in your life as a foundation. You know, the partnership is for a purpose, godly purpose. And you know, he wants us to keep pure. That's why he's leading us to that marriage, perpetual purity. And it's for power, prevailing power. Two are better than one. Don't be wiser than God. And don't say, I don't need what God says I need. Two are better than one in everything. And then in prayer, if two of you shall agree as touching anything, my brother, how do you have a prayer partner outside the home and your wife is not the prayer partner, my dear sister? How is it you have a prayer partner somewhere outside, somewhere outside the country? And your husband is not your prayer partner. If two of you shall agree as touching anything, it gives us prevailing power in prayer. It says God will do it. It also gives us pertinent, present, indispensable protection. The husband is a protection to the wife. The wife is a protection to the husband. The parents are protection to the Children and the children are protection to their parents. Precious procreation. Priceless procreation. Don't let us slow down marriage in the church. Don't let us put any hurdle for any reason before intending couples. Let's help. Let's counsel. Let's encourage. It's not good that half of their life is gone already before they are even getting married. And they have been, they have been with the marriage committee now for one year, two years, three years, and the marriage committee cannot conclude that marriage. If the marriage committee becomes a hurdle, a great, great mountain, what are we praying about? That's a problem not just for those people wanting to marry. It's a great problem for the church. Procreation, precious procreation. Don't allow them to be out of the possibility of getting children before they get married. Encourage them. Pray with them. Show them the way with them. Precious procreation, parental provision, training, and participatory pilgrimage. God will give you the man, God will give you the woman that you will go along in this pilgrimage to heaven together. And the Lord will help. And as you are getting ready, getting prepared, everything you need, the Lord will provide. Prayer is simple. It's as simple as you going to your daddy here on earth. If your daddy had the privilege and the chance to give you a woman, to give you a man, he'll respond immediately. God is greater. God is better. He will give you the appropriate husband, the appropriate wife. Don't allow anything in to give you negative idea about God. He will respond immediately when you ask, graciously when you ask. He will respond and even go beyond your expectation. He'll answer your prayer. Don't have any idol in your heart. To have an idol in the heart is to say, I'm wiser than God. God does not know this man like I know him. 
God does not know the right woman like I would know her. And God, forget about what you are planning. Forget about what you want to give. I have that gift already. Don't act like that. But people of yesterday, what do we know? We don't know tomorrow. God knows the past, the present, and the future. That's why we pray to him. And he will answer your prayer. He'll give you bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh. And then, as you are married now and you have come together, how you need to reestablish that love again, how you need to establish that helpfulness again, how you need to reestablish the purpose again for which you have come together, no strife, no vainglory, no pride, no selfishness, but now you love in a practical way, practical love, purposeful love, passionate love. That maybe people can even tell. And sometimes our parents will say, you love your wife so much. That's not a bad comment. That's good. Do more of that. And then your friends will say, we don't see you anymore. And we can't get at you anymore. You love your wife so much. That's not a bad comment. Do more of that. Let the love be practical. Let it be public to you. Don't be ashamed of your wife in the public. And if things have gone wrong in the past, now rebuild, now strengthen the foundation of that marriage. Let there be righteousness in the fellowship between husband and wife. Righteousness, not a make-believe, not superficial, but make it real, make it definite, righteous fellowship, and it's for a gracious home. And the Lord will grant you that righteous fellowship in the marriage. They love each other. Your husband will know. Your husband will not be wondering. I don't want to ask any question. Does she still love me? That means that thing is not practical enough. Let it be practical. Express it. Say it. Act it. Live it out. Let it be refreshing. Refreshing. A refreshing fulfillment of the growing helpfulness we need to have in the family. And then whatever we do, However we do it, be a daily encouragement for your husband, for your wife to move further, a step further today than yesterday, more excited today about going to heaven, happier today about the rapture, more confident today about being a rapturable couple, be faithful to each other, be an encouragement to each other. Money or no money, money will come, let there be love. Property or no property, it will come, love one another. And whatever it is you don't have now, love will make God to act on your behalf. Everything you need for the family will come. We're here today, happy marriage, there will be happy heaven, happy fellowship in heaven. And the marriage will not hinder our righteousness, our readiness for the rapture. The marriage, the family, will quicken our steps, will move us forward until we hear the trumpet sound. And when the dead rise and the saints are caught up, we'll be with them also in Jesus' name. Round up your prayer now. Believe he has answered your prayer. You're going to have the will of God, the best that God can offer. You're going to have a happy marriage, the best, the happiest God can make your home, your family, your marriage. Father, we well, thank you for this moment. Thank you for the revelation of your word. Thank you for what we have learned today. We pray more grace will come into every life. 
More grace will come into every family. We're praying, oh Lord, more love will come into every heart. More love in every family. And where things are going down, and the wine of love is running out, and we're so familiar and used to each other, we take each other for granted, and there is nothing spontaneous, nothing gracious, nothing happy, and nothing glorious in our families. Oh Lord, repair the broken down walls of our families in Jesus' name. And for young brothers, sisters who are planning to get married after they have known the will of God or they have not known the will of God, O oh Lord, we pray according to your promise that you'll give us the expected end. That expectation give to everyone of our young people in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, the mistakes that other a generation past, generation of believers have gotten into, and great men, good men, great women, good women have not had in the past a good wives and good husbands. The mistake they got into and the pitfalls they, the pit they fell into, rescue all your children, all your people from them in Jesus' name. And we pray that new life, new love, new vitality, new strength, new grace, and new passion will come to every family, even from today in Jesus' name. Take pride away from every heart. Strive away from every heart. Bring glory away from every heart. Canal competition between husband and wife away from every heart. Suspicion away from every heart. Stinginess, selfishness away from every heart. And let your love be deep in every heart. Husband and wife, parents and children, every family. Let your love permeate every area of our family. That Lord will have righteous families. We'll have relational families. We'll have rapturable families. And when the trumpet shall sound, none of us will be found wanting in Jesus' name. Happy, healthy, holy, make everyone individually, make every home as families as well. Lord, do something definite, miraculous, gracious, glorious in every family even today. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Make and keep your families happy, rapturable.